I'm Marian Sasaki. You're watching Life in the Law at Think Tech Hawaii. Um, we're on from 1 to 1.30 on Wednesdays. And we are very lucky today to have a guest um, who has, he's not only a colleague, but a dear friend. She's a family lawyer, and she's been practicing for how long have you been practicing now? 12 years? For six years. Six years, OK. Yes. Uh, her name is Robin Gregory. Welcome, Robin, to the show. Aloha. Robin and I share something, uh, we were just talking about it earlier, we share something uh, in common, and that is the fact that we both went to law school at a, la a later age, right? Yes. We didn't yes. go straight from college to law school. And I want to encourage anybody whose dream that is to pursue that dream, because I think law school is a, is a great place to, um, you know, discover yourself and uh, discover how you fit into the environment, right? I mean, it, it really gives you a place and sense, sense of place in government and a place as a citizen, I think. Right. My first year of law school, I thought everyone should be required to take the first year of law school classes because they teach you about your rights uh, with criminal contracts law, criminal law contracts right Property everything law. that you need to know in life you learn in your first year of it's law school true. <laughs> so it's it's contracts it's property it's criminal law mm -hmm. it's um Constitutional law? No, that's yeah. You, you well, do, I, that's sometimes second, it's yeah. first year. But there's one more. Oh, torts, which is harms. T torts are like yes. harms. Your dog bites somebody. That's a tort. Right. So, well, so how did you find it? I was a little bit. Well, I was the only. I was a, one of two older people in my class, and everybody was a lot younger. Was was that the same case for you? That was the case for me. I uh, graduated from law school in 2010. Mm -hmm. I was 46 years old, and a lot of people were coming straight from their undergraduate, uh, so they were early 20s. I think we had one person who was as young as 21 years old mm -hmm. in our class. So people were a lot younger than me, which means that they had a lot more stamina and energy than well, me. Well, that's true. It requires a lot of focus and dedication, I would right. say. Much more right. than an un undergraduate degree. Law school takes a lot of focus. There's a lot of reading, a lot of heavy reading. Yes. Now, people told me that it would be the hardest thing that I've ever done, and I'm like, I've done a lot of hard things. It's not yeah, you had a baby. Bad. You had right. two babies. <laughs> right. How can it be harder than parenting? <laughs> It was hard. It was so hard. Really? Yes. Really? It's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Because I thought it was just me. <laughs> 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 it is. It's really an incredibly hard thing. It's really a test of your endurance, a test of your focus. Um, mm -hmm. And when you're with younger people, at least it was a test of my composure because uh, you, you have to do a lot of rational arguing and you can't, you can't uh, lose your, you know, lose your composure while you're discussing an issue with somebody, I think. Right. And I have a tendency to do that. <laughs> but you don't, right? Yeah. Oh, no. I, I can lose my composure at times. <laughs> so what did you, when, when, during your first year of law school, what, was there like one section that you really took to? One, like, did you just like love criminal law or? I didn't think I would love criminal law, but I did. I really liked contracts. Contracts was really difficult, Everybody but should I take contracts. like contracts. Because yeah. people didn't even, don't understand what a contract is and how um, how enforceable it really If you agree to something, and you agree, particularly if you agree to something in writing that it, it, it's enforceable, I'll tell you, I have a family mm -hmm. law case going on right now, and the <clears throat> one of the parties agreed that uh, they would give a portion of their retirement income to their ex-spouse. Now, this was 35 years ago. So this guy hasn't seen this woman 35 years. He's remarried, and he's like, well, why do I have to do that? I'm like, listen, you, you signed this agreement. You're, you're bound by this. There's really nothing I can I don't, I don't think the court will modify this, you know. So. Right. Once you sign on the dotted line, it's an agreement, and you cannot get out of it unless the other party signs something that says that you can get out of it. Right, right. Yeah, and we're making contracts every day. Every day we make oral contracts. We agree with someone to do something. Well, if you do this, I'll do this. That's an oral contract, and it can be enforceable. Right, it can be enforceable. Absolutely. So... Well, let's back up a little. How did you decide to go for your BA? I mean, what, because you had, you had a teenager, at least one teenager or two? I had one teenager and one child out of the house. And 
I just always wanted to finish my education. I had started a couple of years of college early on, and then I quit because I had kids and I had other things I, think I that's needed common. to do. I think that's a common common scenario. Mm -hmm. when people have kids and and then they think, well, it's too late for me. But it's never too late, right? Right. It's never too late. It's never too late. Look, I graduated from law school when I was 46 years old, and now I'm practicing law. Anyone can do it at any time. Yeah, the great thing about law, though, is also it's kind of um, age impervious. Like, you can practice law till you're like eight. I've seen people practice law till they're like 80 years old or even older, 85 years old. Right. So y it really doesn't matter when you get your start. You can... Uh, you can always practice. There's always a, uh, an opportunity for you. You, you know, it might not be uh, the glamorous kinds of opportunities that younger people have, but you, you definitely will be able to develop a practice, even if you're in your 40s or 50s. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. right. And one of my fears was that I was too old. No one would hire me because I was too old. I was getting too close to retirement age. And I talked to another attorney, and he said that he thought I would, I would probably be more hireable than some of the younger people right out of law school uh, for one reason and he said this is totally off the record but if a law firm is looking to hire a young woman it's quite quite possible she's going to have one or two kids right and it's a, so, it's a risk mm -hmm. you, you assume that risk yeah absolutely right. and so that attorney is going to be out for a certain amount of time to have those babies and get them settled and so that's something, since I was beyond that, that I could be more hireable. And also because I have some life experiences, and those can help me relate to clients and what's going on in a situation. I think so. And it, keep, it gives you a certain amount of gravitas in court. I mean, I know a lot of people have problems going to court, and I've never felt disrespected by the judges or afraid of the judges and I know like a lot of the younger attorneys are they're just terrified to talk it to speak in court and I, you know you just you've been around so you know mm -hmm. you know what you can say and what you can't say in, you know in a, in a public context I think better yes I think that's true and also I think having more experience we're able to compartmentalize better so that we can say, okay, this happened in the courtroom, it's not personal, right. and, you know, not go home and cry, oh, the judge didn't like what I said. You know. Right, yeah, you know, that's, you know, when I was in law school, I didn't think I'd ever be able to do that. I never, I never thought I'd be able to distance myself from the, the client or the problem or winning or losing, and it's really amazing the way you learn. You don't learn that in law school, you learn that through practice. I mean, there's a reason it's called practice, because you're practicing every day, right? right? Right. And um, you learn you learn that that um, dispassionate because it do, it's you don't serve your client well if you're not dispassionate and rational about what you're doing right. if you take it personally. Yes, absolutely. And it's difficult, especially in family law, not to get personally involved and be feeling the emotions. You know, your clients are going through so many emotions in their divorce. And I oftentimes have to tell clients to go see a counselor because I am trained to take care of their legal needs. I'm not trained to take care of their counseling needs. Right. You know. And particularly, yeah. you know, clients don't realize how expensive they think they're just, you know, I'm just talking to you like you're my friend. And, but it's, you know, we, work, we live and die by the billable hours. So we really have to apportion our time uh, fairly so that we can... Uh, you know, make a decent living, and and you know w we're entitled to that too. The clients are entitled to be zealously represented, but we're also entitled to you know payment for our services. And whenever you yes. counsel a client, you're counseling from a legal perspective. Yes, whether it's a phone call or an email. And I recently had to start telling clients that I had a couple of clients say, "Well, I just talked to you on the phone. I don't know why right. you're billing me for this." I said, I could be doing services for another client, you right. know, uh, rather than talking to you on the phone. So talking to you on the phone, answering your questions, that is a legal service. Right. That's part of the practice of law, I think, is educating your clients. And I think that's something else more mature uh, people are actually better at because um, 
we've dealt with confrontation before. I mean, the actual, and I don't mean uh, violent confrontation, I'm just saying facing that and having to tell people hard news. Mm -hmm. Like, w there's not an avoidance there. We're, we're, be we're better able to, um, you know, speak to somebody and, and, and in, a, in a way that you, you can be heard but not get into, uh, you know, a heated discussion about it. Yes, and I think that being a parent has really helped me with that as well, trying to present something to someone without having them become offended. Right. Okay, I don't like what you're doing. <laughs> right, right. If you did it this way, you know, you might have better results. So what kinds of things did you do when you were in law school? Did you do moot court or were you on a journal or anything, something like that? I did moot court. I did the environmental moot court and I got to go to a competition in White Plains, New York. Wow. Yes, with uh, two other members of my team. Robin's a terrific lawyer, I have to say this. Oh. I know this. Well, You're a terrific you. lawyer. You are. Thank you. Yeah, and that was quite an experience. That was the first time I'd been to New York and it was um, being around all of these other mostly young attorneys who had, I was probably the oldest on the, mm -hmm. in the whole moot court panel, um, but it didn't really matter. Everyone just treated me as a colleague and we all had the same cases, the same case that we were working on. And it was so much fun to be competing against these other attorneys. It was, it was very exciting. Yeah, you know, I've been doing a little bit of litigation lately, and it is really fun. I mean, it's super fun. You know, it's like mm -hmm. a game. It's like a chess game. So I could see the allure. I mean, I, I definitely could see the allure of it. Um, I, it, you know, it's like a mind, you know, I'm going to put this piece here. I wonder how that, that piece is going to, you know, turn out or whatever. Right. So, you, so you must have won a competition while you were in law school to get there. Is that right? Uh, I had to go through a, a vetting process mm -hmm. and not actually win a competition. But the three of us were chosen to be on this team and to represent the University of Montana School of Law. You know, I urge people that are returning to school who think, who have kids or who have other responsibilities, who think they're too busy to participate in extracurricular activities. But extracurricular activities in law school are so important because that's more like the practice of law than school is, right? Yes. Right. Go going to moot court and engaging in moot court it bears much more resemblance to what you do from day to day, or writing for a journal, it bears much more resemblance than sitting in a classroom taking notes or answering Socratic questions, don't you think? I absolutely agree. I learned so much being on the moot court team. I learned about brief writing. I learned about oral presentation which are things that are touched on briefly in law school, but mostly we're looking at the books in law school. Right. And being able to have that hands-on experience and the nervousness of getting up in front of a panel of three judges. Real judges. Yes, they, mm -hmm. were, they were actually real judges who were volunteering for the moot court competition. And that was, that was scary. It is. It's, it's scary. something. Yeah, if it's something you've never done before, it's scary. And so that was a really good experience to have under my belt. I think it sounds like it was great. You know, I have to say, for anybody that's thinking about returning to school, this is what I always say. I always say. I'm, they, they, they always say, you're not afraid of anything. I said, I'm afraid too, but I jump anyway. I'm, it's scary, but you have to do it anyway. And it's, it's, it continues to be scary, and even my practice things continue to be scary. And you just have to forge right, right in. So if, if, mm -hmm. you're, if, you're, if your kids are a little older and you're thinking about, oh, I always dreamed of being a lawyer, I'd say, give, give, at least apply and see, you know, take the LSAT and apply and see if it might not be something that interests you. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back and talk to Robin a little more about her family law practice and so maybe some of her interesting uh, matters that she might be able to tell us about. You're, right. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us to explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Live. Aloha. I'm Richard Emery. I'm with co-host Jane Sugimura of Condo Insider, Hawaii's weekly show about association living. The uh, purpose of these videos is to educate board members and condo residents about issues uh, relating uh, to association living. Uh, we hope they're helpful and uh, that they uh, assist in resolving uh, problems that uh, affect the relationship 
uh, between boards and their residents. Each week, Thursday at 3 p.m., we bring you exciting guests, industry experts, who for free will share their advice about how to make your association a better place to live and answer a lot of very interesting questions. Aloha. We hope you'll tune in. Hi, you're watching Life in the Law. I'm Marianne Sasaki. Of course, you can catch us live on the Internet and any time of the day or night on YouTube. Just, just uh, Google up Life in the Law and you'll be able to see all our all our shows, including this one with Robin Gregory. Thanks for joining me, Robin, today. Thank you, Marianne. Robin's a family lawyer, and uh, I, 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 I was a family lawyer in New York, and I'm, I always have an interest in it because the dynamics are so interesting. I mean, it's, it's like psychology. It's the psychology of people. So um, tell me, what kinds of cases do you, do you do, like a lot of child custody cases? or Those I found always to be very hard. Yes, a lot of my cases involve child custody, whether it's a divorce or a paternity. Now, paternity doesn't necessarily mean that they don't know who the father is. It just means that there's not a marriage involved. And we see that a lot these days, probably a lot more than in the past, where there's a child and the parents have never been married. Um, and so most of my cases do involve custody, which means that emotions are high, you know, when I go into the courtroom, what I do can mean whether the, uh, my client gets to have custody of the children or not. And that makes things very intense. It is, it, it is very intense. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of cases like that. And it's, um, you really don't want to lose for your client because it's your yes. client's child. So, I mean, the, what there's really nothing more at stake, maybe criminal law, there's something more at stake, but there's really nothing more at stake than that. So yes. how did you develop an interest in family law? Well, when I went to law school, I did not plan to be a family law attorney. In fact, I did not take any family law classes. I concentrated more on business and uh, a few criminal uh, classes and contracts. But when I got out into private practice, I found that that's what people needed was family law. They really do. I mean, yes. people ask me constantly about it. I mean, I go to the bank and I do some business at the bank or people, it, it really, it's, it's, it's a really significant area of practice, I think. And uh, yes. it, in my view, and that, it's not my view, in my view, it's not taken seriously enough. But the, the, a lot of um, business law, you know, real estate law, all this law is, 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 is you know, taken very seriously among businessmen and, and family law is like, well, that's not, you know, just squabbling. It's not like real, you know, law, but, but it really isn't. It, uh, you know, it's a delight to, to uh, engage with a real lawyer on the other side and really be able to think about the difficult issues that are facing, it's a cultural, legal cultural issues, you know, like parental alienation or something like this, you know? Yes, I agree, Marianne, that uh, a lot of people think of family law as, oh, something they'll do on the side. Yeah, it's not well, re well regarded, well respected, I guess. Yes, yes, uh, and I'm not quite sure why that is, because it definitely, I think, is one of the hardest areas of law. There are definitely certain statutes that you have to follow. Certain uh, rules have been sent down by the Supreme Court, case law that you have to follow in order to get your clients the spousal support that they need or the uh, custody that they should have. Uh, one of the things that I see often that I find really difficult is parents using the children. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just... It's really common, isn't it? It is really they common. They don't do it intentionally even necessarily, but mm -hmm. it's very common. Right, right. And so the courts often uh, tell the parties, you know, uh, don't send messages through the children. Don't involve the children in the litigation. Don't talk to the children about the divorce except, you know, certain parameters. Kids don't need to be involved in that. They have enough going on. Uh, you know, oh, their, their parents are getting divorced. Yeah. They don't need to be part of the litigation as well. Do they ever appoint um, law, like guardians ad litem or law guardians for uh, children in any cases? They can. Yeah, they can if, if things are bad enough. I have never had a case so far where a guardian ad litem has, has had to be appointed. Um, 
What I try to do rather is try to do some mediation or maybe do a custody evaluator, something like that, that gets us out of the courtroom setting. How do you do that? Like, how would you go about getting a mediator or a custody evaluator? Does the court appoint those people? I mean, can you ask the court to appoint them? Or are they, are they there at the court? Or you have to get an independent uh, person? Or how does that work? Well, it's best to get an agreement between the parties, especially if you're going to do mediation. You really have to have an agreement between the parties that they're going to participate in this mediation. And so then they have a third party uh, who is not involved at all, who basically doesn't care about either mm -hmm. side, except that they want the both sides to resolve right. the issues. And, uh, and so basically then what you do is you go to the court and you say the parties have agreed to mediate. Um, maybe we can't agree on a mediator. Will the court appoint a mediator? Oh, okay. Or we will give, um, each side will give a couple of suggestions of who they want. Is that an independent cost from the cost of um, legal services? I mean, does that cost the clients money? I mean, because mm -hmm. the thing is, you know, a very, a very touchy issue in family was so many times our clients don't, are, don't have a lot of money and, you know, there's not a lot of money to be made. You know, you, you do a big real estate deal, everybody expects to get rich, you know, whatever. Yes. But so, so I was, so is it an extra like burden on if you decide to mediate that it costs more? Yes. Yes, it does cost more. You have to pay the fees for the mediator. The mediator is someone who is making their living, helping people resolve their issues. So yes, the mediator does charge and it's, there are different places that you can go though. If uh, for low income families, they can go to the Mediation Center of the Pacific and they have a sliding fee scale. Right. Uh, Oh, but something that you said, uh, we were talking earlier about family law not being as well respected. And I think one of the reasons is that there is not a lot of money involved. You probably aren't going to get rich being a family law right. attorney right. because these are families, they have other expenses, they have kids, they have houses things like this. It's not like a big corporation. Or even or a big commercial litigation where there's a theoretical prize at the end, like if you win, you win your contract damages. Yes. What yes. Do you, when you win in family law, you win typically, what? well, you can, I guess you can win, uh, you know, uh, child support and uh, spousal support, but really you, you win uh, the organization of the relationship going forward is what usually happens. Yes, that's a good way to put it. Yes. You know, so they should, you know, it's so funny. We're talking about first year classes. Family law should be a first year class because it's really just as fundamental as contract law. And people really ought to know when they have children what their responsibilities will be. I mean, so I've had so many um, parents, dads, not understand the concept of child support. They think it's, you know, basically spousal support, and they don't understand it's their responsibility till the child is. 18 or however old they've, you know, decided. So yes. that's, that would be a really, I mean, I think everyone should t have to take family law. And you know, oddly enough, it's not a requirement in law school. Right, it's not. Yeah, and those are good points uh, that the uh, father or, or mother sometimes is paying the child support and they'll say, well, I don't want to pay my spouse any money. They shouldn't be benefiting from my right. money. They uh, confuse the distinction for spousal and, and child support. Right, right. And, you know, their ex-spouse or ex-partner may have a slightly higher standard of living because they're receiving the child support. But if it's just in consequence with the child having a higher standard of living, then right. who cares? Right. Yeah. It's always, I always find it shocking. I mean, I've had, I've had a number of clients try to... Uh, um, hire me to reduce their child support or for not, you know, you can modify a child support payment if there's changed change circumstances, obviously. But, <clears throat> but I, that, I mean, I've had encounters with people who just, who had plenty of uh, assets and had plenty of income and just out of, you know, sheer spite didn't want to pay. That, that, that's yes. something we should say in family law. There's a lot of, especially if you get the wrong lawyer, there's a lot of spiteful behavior that can ensue. Yes. And I try to, I always try to put a, a damper on that if I can. But there are some lawyers who 
encourage the fight. You know, they encourage, the, they stoke the flames. That's true. I, I do not stoke the flames. And even with a good lawyer, there can still be spite. There can be hurt feelings. Uh, there can be a lot of anger. And that's another reason why people need to see a counselor. So <laughs> there's the, the divorce is getting more and more expensive. You have your attorney, you have your counselor, you have the mediator, and then maybe you're going to a custody evaluator to give a report and a recommendation to the court. So right. divorce can be very, very expensive. It can be very, very expensive. But I would say one thing about mediation, mediation can save you money, actually. It, it, I think every penny that one invests in mediation, it, you, you really often get, get it back, particularly in these personal family circumstances. That mediation is ideal because it gives everybody the opportunity to be heard. Every per person's uh, needs to be addressed. Different solutions can be can be arrived at. So mediation can really abbreviate litigation, I think. Yes, I agree. It can help you to avoid trial. And trial is very spendy. You know, a trial you're looking at, depending on the case, but probably around $10,000 for a trial, you know, and that's getting together witnesses and evidence and actually going to the courtroom, which is probably the least amount of cost in the entire right. trial scenario. But uh, yes, uh, I agree with you that the mediation does save a lot of money and also not only money, but it saves hurt feelings. Relationships. Yes. yes. It saves yes. relationships. Absolutely. Yes. I tell people once they go to trial, if they if they didn't hate each other before they go to trial, they're going to hate each other That's after true. they go to trial. That's true. <laughs> I guess yeah. we agree on this. It, uh, you know, I, I always say don't litigate, mediate, but I mean, yes. really, if you can, you should. Absolutely. So. We're running out of time, so I wanted to thank you for coming. I so appreciate it. And I'm, I'm so fascinated. I'm so, I always, it's such a feminist thing to go back to law school, to go back to school, I always think. And, yeah. you know, I have this little theory about women, you know. Women, men, a, as they get older, they develop more questions about themselves. But women, it's almost the reverse. You don't question yourself as much, and you go with, you know, your gut more, and you, you get you get more powerful. It's kind of, yes. it's a little bit of a strange, uh, strange conundrum. But, and I think uh, returning to school is part of that. Returning to school is f and finding yourself is, is part of that, you know, maturing process can be very valuable. Yes, and I would like to encourage anyone who's thinking of going back to law school, uh, just remember, think you can or think you can't. Either way, you're right. Right. <laughs> Do it, and don't worry about the money. The money will, the money comes one way or another. We find a way, right? Yes. Right. Well, thank you for tuning into Life in the Law. I'm Marianne Sasaki. You can see us every week on Wednesdays from 1 to 1.30. Uh, we'll see you next week.